Je pose la question tout haut que beaucoup de gens se posent tout bas. Êtes-vous certaine que c'est bien votre mari qui a écrit ce roman Je ne fais pas semblant d'avoir 24 ans. J'avais 24 ans. I'm not what you think I am. A literary mystery in blustery Brittany, a digital romance and a crime-fighting Marvel heroine. That's all coming up in our weekly film show. And for that, I'm joined by film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Well, we're starting with something which is adapted from a book, and it's about a publishing phenomenon. But this is not a book. It is a film. <laughs> it's called The Mystery of Henry Pick. Can you tell us more about it? Of course. You know, France still boasts a very lively publishing culture. And despite the fact that books are available online, there are still a great many bookshops thriving in France. This is the fourth book by popular author David Fokinos to be adapted to the screen with, I'm told, two more on the way. So in this film, Daphne, an ambitious young publishing assistant, lives with her boyfriend Fred, whose first novel has just been sold and um, published and sold 237 copies. <laughs> uh, she still loves him, but he's depressed. Uh, on a visit to her father in scenic Brittany, they learn that there's a library collection made up entirely entirely of manuscripts rejected by French publishing houses. It's called the Library of Rejected Manuscripts. <laughs> so there are unpublished manuscripts with titles like Masturbation and Sushi, but Daphne is drawn to one that turns out to be incredibly well-written and compelling, authored by a local man named Henri Pic. He's been dead for two years, he ran a pizza parlor, and his widow says she never, ever saw him read a book, which is not exactly the profile of somebody who would incorporate the Russian author Pushkin uh, into a story about the end of a romance. Daphne convinces the prestigious publisher she works for to bring out the book, which is a runaway commercial and critical success. How oh, very convenient. It does sound a bit too good to be true. Uh, so it does. That's exactly what influential literature cri critic Jean-Michel Roche, who hosts a popular TV show about books, thinks. Roche is played by a very well-cast Fabrice Lucchini. His wife kicks him out and his network fires him, so he suddenly has a lot of time on his hands to go do literary detective work in the company of Henry Pick's reluctant daughter, Josephine. Could Henri Pick, pizza maker, really have written such a sublime novel? And if he didn't, who did? Ah, well, let's take a look at Fabrice Lucchini and Camille Cotin bickering pleasantly in the film. Vous prenez pour qui? Vous avez le culot de venir ici? Mais ça va pas bien, vous! Pourquoi Henri Pick? Pourquoi toute cette mystification J'ai besoin de vous pour aller au bout de cette enquête. Vous êtes un peu mon docteur Watson. Et pourquoi c'est vous, Sherlock Holmes bah Parce que c'est mon enquête. Si on pouvait trouver une lettre, une carte postale... Bah, J'en ai des lettres de lui. Ouais, c'est pas exactement ce dont je me souvenais. Peut-être que c'est en tombé sur la liste de courses de Proust. Bah. Oui, mais on a retrouvé la liste des courses de Proust et ça de la gueule. Now, this was way more fun than I expected it to be. At one point, a character says, the problem with France is that one out of every three people is writing a book. So that means <laughs> that is true. more writers than there are readers. France does boast several long-running TV and radio programs devoted entirely to opinionated people arguing about books. Uh, this is a lightly comical detective story with about art and success and talent and marketing sumptuously shot in Paris and in Brittany. Okay. Okay. Well, next, uh, we're staying with French cinema to Juliette Binoche, who is rarely far from French screens. Now, in this latest film, Who You Think I Am, she goes mostly barefaced. She's not wearing makeup most of the time. And she plunges into the murky world of social media. You know, there's a New Yorker cartoon I've always loved where you see a dog seated in front of a computer and the caption is, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> in this film, on social media, a photographer in his 20s named Alex has no idea that the intriguing Clara he believes to be a supple 24-year-old blonde who manages fashion events is actually a 50-ish divorced mother of two named Claire who teaches literature at a university. Like in Spike Lee's recent fact Based Black Klansman, where a black police officer imitating a typical white voice manages to infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan over the phone, but uh, literally cannot show his face to join the KKK. The relationship between Alex and Clara is problematic right off the bat because Juliette Binoche is definitely physically no longer 24 years old. No, she looks amazing, but she isn't 24 in real life. Well, let's take a look at Juliette Binoche creating that digital persona. Et chaque mot a été choisi avec soin. Une toute petite erreur de ma part, une, 
Une seule faute de langage et... La magie risquait de disparaître. So like you say, she's a university professor. Shouldn't someone like that know better than to get themselves into such a sticky situation? Indeed, she's teaching dangerous liaisons to her students, mm. which is, of course, an epistolary novel of romance and cruelty in which some characters have information and others don't. Same thing here, only via smartphones, uh, not actual letters written with ink on parchment. And yes, she definitely should be smarter. But she's lonely, misses the attention of men, and finds the virtual relationship exciting both intellectually and increasingly sexually. She not only finds 20-something Alex quite attractive, but when she's posing online as 24-year-old Clara, she feels as if she's really 24, and she likes that feeling. Yeah, but after all this subterfuge, after exchanging all of these messages, I'm sure that Alex uh, eventually wants to see what Clara really looks like. <laughs> well, of course he does, and when Alex, who seems like a very nice guy, clamors for a photo, she has to do something, so she grabs a random photo of someone completely unlike herself off uh, online, and and most red-blooded young guys would find this image attractive. The structure of the film is that Claire, who we gather has either had a nervous breakdown or even attempted suicide, is recounting all this to a therapist, played by Nicole Garcia. Just how powerful are completely virtual relationships? I think it's something we should certainly continue looking into. And to match the strange tone of carrying on a romance exclusively via cell phone, the film was shot in the rather sterile eastern neighborhoods of Paris around the, the, the big library named for Francois. Mitterrand. The film has been sold to several countries, including the US. Sounds like a story for our times. Now, next to a film out here in France, and it's the first feature to be shot on location in Iraq by an Iraqi and to be shown in Iraqi cinemas in 27 years. That is quite a feat. Tell us about the journey. Well, I like the French title Baghdad Station much better because the film is set almost entirely in Baghdad's central train station on December 30th, 2006, the day Saddam Hussein is ex to be executed and a train of dignitaries is expected. An intense young woman named Sarah is wired up with explosives and has a detonator in her pocket. I hate to say it, but this is an instance where some mild sexual harassment saves lives. Why is that? A con man named Salam hits on Sarah, trying to chat her up, not realizing he has picked the one female least likely to <laughs> respond to his advances. She shows him the detonator, takes him hostage, and the two are joined at the hip as a baby in a duffel bag enters their orbit, and they're picked up by patrolling American soldiers. So presumably she doesn't blow anything up, not straight away at least. Uh, no, I can sort of understand wanting to blow something up. What, I, what I've never been able to understand is blowing yourself up with whatever it is. Hijacking airplanes took off, so to speak, uh, when I was an adolescent, but the goal of the hijackers was always to get somewhere in one piece. What changed on September 11, 2001, was that dying a so-called martyr became part of the mission. Yeah, and it dominates the, the headlines uh, today. Well, France 24 interviewed the director about the challenges of making this film on location. Let's hear from him. It was very tense, but we had the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army. They were really in support of this production. I had foreigner crew and cast and we managed to like sort of to protect the train station and to seal it really with the army and the police so we, we we know for sure that has been protected but still the street was very tense compared with today no today Baghdad is safe uh, like m maybe if I joke safe and then Paris or anywhere you know uh, thanks to God alhamdulillah uh, but on the time it was uh, very difficult so quite the challenge, and I can imagine that just getting this film produced was a heroic uh, feat. It was a co-production between Iraq, the UK, France, the Netherlands and Qatar. Is the result worth it? Well, the film is inherently suspenseful, but not all that original. There have been quite a few movies with suicide bombers or would-be suicide bombers, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go out exploring the important topic. Uh, here it's a strange combination. Although the pair form a relationship of, of sorts, it's definitely not a buddy movie. In fact, I'd call it a nobody movie. And if there was an award for best severe ex expression, this actress would win it. Uh, Sarah and Salam get swept up by no-nonsense American soldiers. American soldiers serving in foreign countries 
countries as depicted in movies always shout in English and display zero patience as if shouting at people in a language they don't understand is guaranteed to get results. So if somebody burst into the studio right now shouting at us in Arabic, we wouldn't know whether they were saying we're here to harvest your organs, resistance is futile, or get down and nobody gets hurt. We, how would we know? Indeed, <laughs> it's true, it sounds quite topical. Now, finally, we're moving to a film that's about to sweep into theatres worldwide. It is the latest Marvel feature, and we know that because there's a clue in the title. It's called Captain Marvel. <laughs> yes, and it's getting hard to continue to marvel at the Marvel superhero movies when there are so many of them. Some are quite entertaining, but this is the 21st entry in the so-called Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, I haven't seen this one yet, but I'd like to make an observation. We are, of course, sadly... Witnessing a rise in knee-jerk, underinformed, ignorant, anti-Semitic language and violent acts. What's the connection? Well, if there's anybody out there who hates Jews or thinks they hate Jews, please keep in mind that the characters in Marvel Comics were overwhelmingly created and drawn by Jewish guys, white Jewish guys. I'm talking about Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, the Avengers, the Incredible Hulk, Thor, Iron Man, Black Panther, Daredevil, Doctor Strange, and yes, Captain Marvel. And in addition to those guys, this time around, it's actually a girl saving the universe. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll leave you with a clip of Brie Larson as Captain Marvel. Do remember to check out our website for more movie news and you can keep up with us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Name a detail so bizarre a scroll could never fabricate it. A toast is cut diagonally, I can't eat it. You didn't need that, did you? No, no I didn't, but I enjoyed it. Okay, your turn. Prove you're not a scroll. <laughs>